Hello, and welcome to the Medical Center Hour, the University of Virginia's weekly public forum on medicine, healthcare, and society. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Health Humanities and Ethics in the School of Medicine. It's great that you've joined us today. Indeed, please do come every Wednesday. The slides that open and close this program offer resources, information about continuing health professional education credit, and bookstore links. There's also a link to our center's website with information about today's presenters, our spring program lineup, and Medical Center Hour videos on our YouTube channel. This program is being recorded and closed captioned and will be posted to YouTube. On Zoom, we handle audience contributions using the Q&A function. Please write your questions and comments there. We'll monitor the questions as they come in and make them the focus of my conversation with our presenters at the close of the hour. Today's program, Why Doctors Write, in their own words, is our annual Ellis C. Moore Memorial Lecture. The Moore Lecture remembers Ellis C. Moore, a UVA medical graduate who went on to have a career in otolaryngology in New York City. The Moore Lecture features doctors who write and gives us a chance to focus on what's become a flourishing subspecies of physician, the doctor who writes. Across history, there have been doctors who write, even some who became more famous for their literary output than their clinical outcomes. Think Arthur Conan Doyle of Sherlock Holmes fame or modernist poet, William Carlos Williams. But now many doctors write and not just after hours or as a pastime. And medical schools like UVA are encouraging doctors to write, even connecting writing with the core clinical skills of reflection and self-reflection and with improved clinical practice. But why really do doctors write? In their own words, what might physicians say about why writing matters to them, why it gets them up early in the morning or keeps them awake late, how it anchors them. So this Moore lecture features three University of Virginia physician writers, two internists and a pediatrician, two poets and a prose writer, two assistant professors and a professor emeritus. However you parse them, they're a dynamic trio. Besides practicing medicine and writing, they all teach, including with and about their writing. Our three presenters in order are Dr. Daniel Becker, Professor Emeritus of Medicine and author of Second Chance, a newly published prize-winning collection of poems. Second is Dr. Ben Martin, Assistant Professor of Medicine, a UVA hospitalist who's at work on a novel. And Dr. Irene Mathieu, Assistant Professor of Pediatrics and author so far of three books of poetry. The Moore Lecture Fund resides in the UVA Medical Alumni Association, and we're grateful for the Alumni Association's partnership with Medical Center Hour, and thus their celebration of doctors who write. And again, we'll start with Dr. Becker. Um, good afternoon, everyone. When, when Marcia invited me to speak today, I agreed under one condition, only if Tony Fauci was not available for a return of performance on Medical Center Hour. Um, I hope that everyone watching and listening is either vaccinated or has an appointment for vaccine or is planning to make an appointment. Um, is my slide up, by the way? Coming. There it is. Okay, you can see a phone number on that slide um, and also my email address and you're welcome to email me because I'm a self-appointed vaccine ambassador and I'll try to be helpful. Um, as for the right half of this slide, that really is a bear on the driveway to the building where I have been seeing patients since 1985. Funny things happen on the way to work, at work, on the way home, and at home. By funny, I mean worthy of reinvention. Writing for some of us and reading good writing for most of us works the way a vaccine does. It deflects the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. It protects us. It can make us a little more happy or a little less sad. 
Moreover, it can make that sadness or happiness a little more interesting. And speaking of happy, I'm really happy to share a Zoom podium with Ben and Aren. Our orbits keep intersecting and I hope that that continues. Um, ben and Aren and I are different kinds of doctors and different kinds of writers. Uh, and just as 10 doctors in a room will have 100 clinical opinions on an interesting clinical problems, three doctors in a virtual space will complicate and elaborate the question that today's medical center hour poses. Um, in considering the question why doctors write, we should limit the discussion to legible doctors writing. So why do doctors write? Uh, some of us can't not write. It's a habit, a habit of the heart as much as of the mind. Let's start with what we write. Clinic notes, memos, grants, scientific articles, budget justifications, results letters, letters of recommendation, pleas to third parties for prior authorization, memos, emails, text messages, textbooks, chapters in textbooks, grocery lists, kitchen table notes explaining why we're working late, poems, stories, essays, novels, and on occasion, a handwritten thank you or condolence note. As a division chief, I enjoyed writing holiday and birthday poems to staff. Thus, roses are red, violets are thirsty. I almost forgot, today is your birthday. Some of my results notes to patients were in rhyming couplets and I'll save those for the Q&A. Lots of doctors write poems and stories. Some lawyers also write poems and stories. Some insurance adjusters, I have Wallace Stevens in mind, write mind boggling poetry. There is a plumber poet who I know who writes about the joys of language and watertight pipe fittings. There is many good nurse poets as there are good doctor poets. In troubled times, there are never enough first responders or good poets. William Carlos Williams, a great poet and a good doctor, reminded us, reminds us that we don't get the news in poems, but people die every day for lack of what we find in poems. If you wonder about the inspiring effect of poetry, check out the YouTube video of young poet Amanda Gorman reading The Hill We Climb at President Biden's inauguration. While all good poets and essayists and fiction writers know how to build and enjoy a good sentence, so do doctors. Some of my most soaring and hyperbolic sentences occur in strongly worded letters to insurance companies or pharmacy benefit managers or durable medical equipment purveyors who, it turns out, do read and they do listen to reason and change their minds when you capture their attention. Most of my writing has been in clinic notes. Every once in a while, the clinical history mentions that a particular patient walks a dog for exercise and that the dog's name is Pavlov. A doctor who knows the dog's name is a doctor who pays close attention, a doctor who listens, a doctor who asks the patient, by the way, what's your dog's name? I could spend the rest of my allotted time on dogs, mine, my patients, dogs that come to clinic, dogs that wander in and out of my poems. When I mention the dog's name in my note, that's a note to self, a reminder to me and anyone reading the note that this patient, like all patients, has a particular story to share and is more than the sum of medical problems and medications. A bad writer can be a good doctor or scientist, but a great doctor or scientist needs to be at least a good writer. As an above average doctor in a good day, and as a struggling scientist back in the days when my career encouraged research, I woke up one morning and learned that I had 700 new patients. The PCP era had begun. All UVA employees had to choose a PCP and there weren't that many of us at that time at UVA. My grant writing days were over. No time to gather and analyze data no more carefully crafted research abstracts that use every word the abstract form allowed. By then I had a pretty serious writing habit. I woke up every morning way before sunrise while the house was quiet. And rather than writing grants and papers, I started making up stories. Most of those stories don't need a clinic or hospital or a doctor. They often make the case that tragedy is failed comedy. They all benefit from a doctor's ear. They're written to be heard and on the page, they look like poems. 
They're also fictions or fictions in their most complicating details. If inspired by a real family or person, the final version is either unrecognizable or a gift that person or family has acknowledged. As an above average doctor on a good day, I'm a good listener all the time. I'm not talking about my stethoscope. I listen for the story and the accent that goes with the story and the origins of the accent and the unique intonation and syntax that make the story worth reinventing and sharing. I also listen to the body language, the snap of two fingers, the shrug, the look out the window or down at the floor, the emblem on the hat, the name tattooed on the neck, the silence that, at la that outlasts my need to keep asking questions. These are stories that make me a better listener. And as I became a better listener, I became a better doctor. I also became eager to make home visits. If there are stories in clinic visits, there are novels in home visits. The first poem I'm reading today is the first poem I published. It's called Home Visit, and it was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 2001. So can we, I hope you folks can read this. Home Visit. We follow a blue Ford tractor pulling a wagon and moving slowly, scattering straw like exhaust, south side Virginia in July, still haying season, so hot the haze shimmies on the asphalt. June bugs strafe the windshield, the afternoon breeze a warm sponge. The nurse is the guide telling me how to greet other drivers, lift two ting fingers from the steering wheel, only two, show some restraint. Where to park, watch out for the dog, stretching a yawn, scored ribs settling on a minor cord. Who's who as we edge through the home, front porch to back, generations ungapped, no work, no school, no AC, fans were, TV promises a better life. We reach the kitchen and in the pantry, an old woman with electric hair and petrified eyes hums a gospel. She looks straight through us. She's expecting Jesus, sweet Jesus. The next poem is also a transcendental moment. It's about swimming laps. What I miss most of the pre-pandemic days was swimming at UVA's North Ground Pool. There are a few phrases in this poem with melody and you'll have to imagine the melody. I can hear a tune, but I can't carry it. Swimming with John's ghost. During the memorial service, after the mensch acclamation and before the sermon-sized metaphor that started with the tree then lost me, a comrade from the morning shift at college, they shared a lecture hall and the appreciation that all sleepy students are each sleepy in different ways, quoted John bragging about having the North Grounds pool all to himself at sunrise. Morning people brag about their mornings. This morning, the lifeguards, proving they do pay attention to the lives they guard, have the music turned to oldies. Sam Cook crooning, you, ooh, 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 send me, as Sam's fans adjust their goggles. John, easy to spot in that deep blue bathing cap he claimed helped part the waters, takes the lane next to me. We're standing there praying the water isn't as cold as it is and waiting for one of us to acknowledge our existence. Bummer about that service, I say, hoping not to sound too relieved. He doesn't want to share my lane. Total, he says. Then we submerge. Strange how dying helped his stroke. He doesn't have to breathe, but does. Old habits die hard. I'm a little choked up in the locker room, and he suggests doing something about that cough. He would know. Since it is a locker room, I share some locker room wisdom. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. John takes his cue. Practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. We allow a moment of silence, but before any hymns erupt, I share my favorite hymn fact. Emily Dickinson poems can be sung to the tune of Amazing Grace. I dwell in possibility, he sings, almost on key. Then asks if he can borrow my brush. Get real, I answer. Who wants to catch someone else's static? We complain about chlorine and dry itchy skin. 
We put our pants on one leg at a time, an act of faith that grounds us. See you later, he promises, and just like anyone, walks out the door. Um, the last poem is a li listening poem, and this is a found poem because parts of it I just found in a day um, of paying attention. It's about a newly retired doctor um, auditing a um, music class at UVA. It's called Among the Deep Listeners and Deep Listening 101. Among the Deep Listeners and Deep Listening 101 are music majors, majors taking the class for credit and an auditor on social security who can only hum one note and that's the note he hums. Overtones find a major chord. Then we march off and find a place to sit and list the sounds while building castles out of sound. Listening is the hardest thing a brain does, according to listening psychologists soliciting grants and donations. It is now possible to sell, follow sound up the brainstem and into the attic. Some sounds turn on all the lights, other sounds turn them off. In one creation myth, human ears fly like bats from one echo to another. The bats returning to my attic don't trigger the motion detector in our driveway. It takes poetic license to claim that motion detectors listen, unless the motion detector is a sleeping dog who wakes up to announce the UPS truck in the driveway. Look around, listen up. There are worlds beyond our threshold. During the field trip outside the sound free chamber, those strangers pounding at the door, heartbeats. I time this talk at a 20% gratuity. Gratuity, if anyone in the audience is still interested, there's now a book, Second Chance, as Marcia mentioned. And um, I hope you, if you're gonna buy it, buy it at an independent bookstore like New Dominion Bookstore on the downtown mall or the UVA bookstore. Um, um, independent bookstores and small poetry presses, presses need the support. Thank you. And next. Well, I'm so honored to share this time with Danny and Aren. And um, I'm really glad to see that Danny decided to include his poem, Swimming with John's Ghost, because one of the things I keep coming back to thinking about why doctors write is um, sometimes doctors write as a way of making peace with patients who haunt us. And so with that in the, the front of our minds, uh, what I want to do is uh, take this time, the next 14 minutes, to read an essay that I've written. Uh, and the essay is really about two things. One is the relationship that I developed uh, with a patient I took care of last year. And the other is one of my favorite books, which is the novel Life and Times of Michael Kay by the South African novelist J.M. Kutsia. And uh, the title of the essay is Michael Kay and Mr. S. <clears throat> in J.M. Coetzee's novel, Life and Times of Michael Kay, an unnamed military medical officer broods over his patient, the eponymous Michael Kay. Quote, you are like a stick insect, Michaels, whose sole defense against the universe of predators is its bizarre shape. You are like a stick insect that has landed, God knows how, in the middle of a great wide flat bare concrete plain. You raise your slow, fragile stick legs one at a time. You inch about looking for something to merge with, and there is nothing. Quote. The officer, a pharmacist by training, has been deployed as a bedside clinician in a makeshift hospital for political prisoners. He works for the tyrannical government carrying out the forced migration and imprisonment of seemingly all non-white people in the novel's quasi-fictional South Africa destabilized by civil conflict. The officer's simile is one of many attempts to make sense of the man he is charged with treating. Life in Times of Michael Kay is primarily a story of the protagonist's survival. On his journey as a hunted person of color, Michael Kay squats on an abandoned farm, hides in the mountains from roving police, escapes a labor gang and a prison camp, and subsists on pumpkins he grows from seed. Michael travels great distances by foot. The omniscient narrator writes, Sometimes the only sound he could hear was that of his trouser legs whipping together. From horizon to horizon, the landscape was empty. It is near the end of the novel when soldiers apprehend Michael, malnourished and stuporous, and relinquish him to the medical officer. Michael is one of the great characters of modern literature who knows solitude. 
and solitude has been on my mind. I recently reopened the book, hoping to learn something about one of my own patients who seemed impossibly alone. Last March, as COVID spread, I assumed care of a man I will call Mr. S, a 64-year-old who first presented to the emergency department with confusion and recurrent falls. At that time, months before I met him, he had been treated for acute alcohol withdrawal. His electrolytes returned to normal, his bumps and bruises healed, cultures of his blood and urine grew nothing, but his confusion did not improve. He saw rats running across the floor. He heard whispered voices about the end of the world. He seemed to have no reliable short-term memory. Each time someone asked him what he did yesterday, he offered a different response. Shopping for a jacket, clearing out brush from the woods, working on the frame of a house. When asked if he knew where he was, he responded, keyboard. Brain imaging didn't turn up an explanation. The neurology and psychiatry consultants agreed that Mr. S's presentation was consistent with permanent memory loss and psychosis due to chronic alcohol use and vitamin B1 deficiency, Korsakoff syndrome, a condition known for its feature of confabulation. If you ask someone with Korsakoff syndrome what they did last night, they can't remember. So their brain involuntarily offers up fabricated event. The region of Mr. S's brain that regulates emotion and memory had been irreparably damaged. Mr. S ate his meals and exercised with physical therapists. His hallucinations improved with daily quetiapine, but he couldn't retain the names of his pills, couldn't remember when to take them. He continued to have difficulty getting dressed by himself. He was better, but was he ready to leave the hospital? He had no spouse or living relatives. He had some old friends who were reluctant to help and eventually stopped answering the phone. He had nowhere to go. One rainy afternoon, he vanished. It took hours for police to track him down on the median strip of a highway, hair matted, desperately searching for a pair of boots that didn't exist. Without protest, he let the officers return him to the hospital and the matter of his discharge was settled. Mr. S needed a so-called memory unit, a facility where patients with cognitive disease and unpredictable behavior receive care under strict supervision. Beds on these units are hard to come by. Weeks added up on the timeline. When I met Mr. S, he had been in the hospital for months, but there was little for me to do as his doctor. We spent our time exchanging pleasantries. How do you feel, I asked him each day. I'm healing, he would tell me, eyeing my stethoscope. When I asked if he had shortness of breath or chest pain, there was some variety in his responses, a mild display of confabulation, but the spirit was the same. The bronchitis is getting better, or the pneumonia is all gone. He passed afternoon stretched out in bed, or sitting in a chair by the window, a sport coat on, a Bible in his lap. One day I found him writing scripture on the wall's whiteboard. He made no mention of my face mask and goggles, now mandatory protective equipment when examining any patient. The pandemic had made its way across the globe, but for Mr. S, nothing had changed in his inner reality, or at least nothing I could detect. What was his life like before he came to us? In a decade-old note, in the virtual bottom of his electronic file, I found a passing reference to a year he spent in sobriety at the Faith and Healing Farmstead. Nowhere else in the chart was this part of his life mentioned. It is easy for me to fill in the gaps, imagine him performing the activities his mind now offers as confabulation. Chopping wood, knocking fences together, rolling cigarettes. But the stories of his chart do not reveal the answers to my real questions. Where do you belong? What do your stories and their gaps mean? As with Mr. S, Michael K comes under medical care in an advanced state of malnutrition, his inner world cordoned off. Michael either ignores the medical officer's questions or offers evasive responses. His inscrutability frustrates the officer who continues to call him Michaels even after Michael corrects him. The officer doesn't trust Michael to know his own name. You are like a stick insect, the officer tells him. It is one of many attempts to assign meaning to Michael with animal imagery. The officer compares Michael to a pet duckling, the runt of a cat's litter, and a fledgling expelled from the nest. He is like a bunny rabbit sewn up in the carcass of an ox. In the degrading imperialist spirit of Dutch settlers in Cape Colony who described indigenous people clucking like turkey cocks, the medical officer speculates that providing Michael with physical rehabil rehabilitation would be like trying to teach a rat or a mouse, or dare I say it, a lizard to bark and beg and catch a ball. 
Via the omniscient narrator, the reader learned that Michael too attempts to understand himself through animal metaphor. Quote, when he tried to explain himself to himself, there remained a gap, a hole, a darkness before which his understanding balked. Quote, at the limits of self-knowledge, Michael casts himself as a snail without its shell, an earthworm, a mole. He does not consider soaring kites or stalking panthers. The animals with which he identifies are small or subterranean the kind that seek the vital protection their physical form cannot supply. At one point, lying on the ground after escaping from a work camp, he thinks, I am like an ant that does not know where its hole is. Solitude in its loneliest form. The reader is drawn into a patchwork of animal imagery as an instrument of explication, but neither Michael nor the officer seem convinced by their effort. Forgive me, Michaels, the officer imagines himself telling his patient. I only want to tell you what you mean to me, then I will be through. It is a plea originating from self-interest. Once he can explicate Michael, the officer will be one step closer to understanding his own role in a tragic history, one step closer to making sense of the chaos unschooling around him. How did the novel's racist hellscape come to pass? The reader is never given an origin story. The armed agents of the government carry out their duty with indifferent cruelty. A guard at a work camp tells Michael, you climb the fence and I'll shoot you dead, mister. No hard feelings. Stopping Michael at a checkpoint, a motorcyclist warns, you wanna stop on the expressway, you pull 50 meters off the roadside. That's the regulation. Anything near you can get shot, no warning, no questions asked. The phrase, no questions asked, seems to summarize the spirit of the militarized state. In exchange, Michael adopts a rejoinder, no answers offered. So, Michael's solitude is a shield. He has no reason to trust the medical officer. He forgoes durable friendships with other prisoners, observing them from afar to avoid their ire. He manages to be solitary even when crammed into a train car. But his shield is an imperfect defense against the ubiquitous machinery of state violence, and his prolonged starvation underscores the limits of his autonomy. Nowhere to buy seeds, no fresh water in sight. At times, the only decision to make is whether to walk through a spell of dizziness or lie down. If I can explicate Michael where the officer comes up short, I have less luck with Mr. S. During my seven days as his doctor, my other patients changed course. My patient with pneumonia went home with an oxygen tank. My patient with kidney injury went home with hospice care. Mr. S continued to sleep in, sometimes until early afternoon. He drank coffee and flipped through the Bible. When there was time, his nurses would take 20 minutes to sit by his side, talk about whatever came to mind. He spent most of his day alone. On the morning he deviated from our normal pleasant exchange, Mr. S looked me up and down. This is a wicked town, he told me. Anything bothering you physically? I asked. I'd be better if I was left to hell alone, he said. Fair enough, I said, backing away. I can come by later. Fair enough, he repeated, that's right. No papers, no money, the medical officer muses on Michael. No family, no friends, no sense of who you are. The obscurest of the obscure. Michael K, Mr. S, both alone, both obscure. Is this why I feel compelled to draw a link between them? If Mr. S is like Michael, am I like the medical officer? By all measurements, he is my fictional shade. Like him, I view my patient with a gaze distorted by the desire for meaning. Like him, I foist symbolism on a person who never asked to be symbolized. Instead of filling in the gaps in Mr. S's chart, I should follow Michael's example and try to explain myself to myself. What kind of animal am I? Am I like a wandering ant? Are my goggles like the compound eyes of a fly? Does my prowling in the hallways, leaving and returning to my patient's rooms, mimic the path traced by something more sinister, like a wolf? If Mr. S is both like and unlike Michael K, if I am both like and unlike the medical officer, what about our respective environments? As COVID spread through the US last spring, studies revealed disproportionately high rates of morbidity and mortality in persons of color. At the same time, nationwide protests filled the streets in response to a string of racist murders at the hands of police. In May, the NAACP called for the United Nations to classify US police violence against black Americans as a human rights violation. Some cities condemned the violence. 
Others issued curfews enforced by police. In the headlines, lootings, beatings, gas canisters arcing into unarmed crowds. A friend sent me a photo of a burning car taken from a window in the COVID unit of his hospital. In the footage of George Floyd's murder, the crime is partially hidden by a police car, but the killer's face occasionally emerges into view, a crease in his brow, eyebrows raised almost quizzically as if to say, no hard feelings. At the end of life and times, Michael manages to climb the fence and flee the hospital. He walks the landscape and imagines quenching his thirst by tying a teaspoon to string and lowering it into a well, an image of hope, a pitiful image. One can drink from a teaspoon, maybe, but a cup is not too much to ask for. Over half a year from the night of his admission, months after we parted ways, Mr. S also left the hospital, at last discharged to a memory facility. In a different kind of story, in a different environment, a long lost friend might track him down, pay him a visit from time to time. But if his solitude changes character, I will never know about it, probably for the best. Best not to think of Mr. S like one thing or as something else. Best to resist the temptation to wring out meaning from unyielding sources. Instead, I cling to my understanding of Michael like a fist around a spoon. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really pleased to be here with Ben and Danny, and I will be reading a section of an essay as well, and then just a few poems. So when Marsha asked us to consider this question of why doctors write, I really wanted to turn the question on its head because I felt that for me, it would be more accurate to ask why a, this writer became a doctor. So I'll go ahead and start with my essay. I grew up with the language of medicine. My mother, a pathologist, and my father, an internist turned dermatologist, who I should mention trained under Danny Becker, made laboratory talk at the dinner table. Sarcoma, specimen, histiocyte, mitoses. They talked cases, of course, with patients' names redacted over red beans and rice. And in this way, the vocabulary of medicine became mundane to me. The first little girl I startled with my presence had just arrived to the hospital. She and her mother were settling down in their room when I came in to examine her. I was wearing a new dress. I told them I would be her doctor. The girl and her mother and I had the same color of skin. They looked at me as if I were foreign to them. You can't be my doctor, proclaimed the girl. Why not, I asked. Because doctors don't wear dresses. I, I mean, stammered the mother, you're so young. How can you possibly be old enough to be a doctor? Harvard University has created a series of tests that participants can use to examine their implicit biases. With them, anyone who has access to the internet and relative dexterity of the fingers can diagnose herself with homophobia, fat phobia, anti-blackness, and a range of other social biases. I once took the test that tells whether you think that women are emotional and associated with the humanities and men are pragmatic and science oriented, the common social assumptions. My results were women strongly associated with pragmatism and science, men strongly associated with emotion and the humanities. I was not surprised. My father regularly weeps over Beethoven sonatas. My male partner is a humanities professional. My mother, when I read her a new poem of mine says, why don't you just say what you mean? I have seen her cry once. People still card my mother when she buys alcohol, although I won't tell you her age. She is a young woman, but to me, she has always been a doctor. This is important. Let me say it again. To me, my mother has always been a doctor. If you don't see it, you don't know it. But there are things, are other things that we know without being able to see them. There have been times I have a feeling about a patient, how her asthma may flare over the next few hours or how he will be fine with some extra fluids and I am right. In medicine, we have a plethora of data. Some would argue too much. There are many ways to measure what we know about the body and all the ways it might turn on us. Yet we still have yawning gaps in health outcomes based on gender, race, and a host of other social categories. We spend astronomical amounts on health care, but life expectancy in the United States does not reflect this. And there are some things we cannot measure, but don't know how to predict. This is where the unsayable knowing takes over. 
Perhaps it is intuition sharpened by experience. This is the art of medicine. No one ever taught it to me, but the best physicians I know have it tamed, honed, the finest of arts, the most human of humanities. Some people predict that doctors will soon be replaced by robots capable of synthesizing data and algorithms that can diagnose and manage disease. Perhaps we can teach robots the science of medicine, but I do not think we can teach its art, which is the result of deep and multidimensional listening, the kind of listening a robot could never replicate. For a long time, I had no interest in the profession. I did not want to become a doctor because I liked reading and writing, and I did not think that these had anything to do with medicine. Furthermore, medicine felt like an inheritance, a set of hand-me-down clothes, and like many children, I did not want to become my parents by default. At a summer program in high school, I wrote a long and strangely specific poem about how I would never study neuroscience, declaring my independence from the medical sciences as a whole and swearing to a life of the humanities. I rejected the arrogance I sensed undergirding scientific discourse. I rankled at the know-it-allness of Western biomedicine, although I didn't consciously know what alternatives or complements to it might exist. I did know that I loved the feeling of finding words for an emotion or sculpting a thought into something beautiful and translatable when I wrote stories and poems. I loved the deep sense of peace and connectedness that settled over me when I spent hours mucking around in the woods or swimming in just about any body of water. Surely these knowledges meant something too. I challenged my mother one day in high school. I think there are many ways to know things and human beings are limited by our five not very good senses. So I hate how arrogant people are about science. It's not the only thing. That's why I'm not going to be a doctor. My mother, whose character you understand by this point, given my implicit bias test results, returned, yes, but it works. I had to admit she was right. Antibiotics save lives. Vaccines prevent fatal diseases. Technology can be used to buy time for a body working to heal itself. The advances of modern medicine, I had to admit, are real and important. When we were kids, my siblings and I would spend our trips to the local hippie grocery store clustered in the aisle where incense, candles, essential oils, crystals, and fragrant soaps were found. We'd touch and smell the items, occasionally imploring my parents to buy us something. We called this part of the store the magic section. I found myself particularly attracted to amethyst. Years later, I'd find out that amethyst is associated with healing. I think those items were appealing to us because we sensed in them something that wasn't present in our daily lives. There was an inexplicable energy, a deep vibration that appealed to us. These objects represented another way of knowing the world for us kids surrounded by biomedicine, and that foreign knowledge felt powerful. My years of practice have only solidified my conviction that spiritual and scientific understandings complement one another, that there is no separation between the mind and body, and that some things we can never fully understand. And I've come to love that uncertainty. Perhaps this is the core of my own spirituality, my faith in a universe that functions beyond my or anyone's comprehension and in its infinite existence long before and after the last of us lives. I am fundamentally a healer. For me, Western biomedicine provides one limited set of tools for effective healing. It's wonderful, but it isn't everything. I started journaling before I could physically write, demanding that my mother take down my dictations. Later, I delved into writing stories and poems. Poetry depends on uncertainty. My best poems are forays into nebulous thought feelings, what Eduardo Galeano called senti pensamientos. The language sorts the muck in my brain until a pattern is created, synapses are linked, and a narrative has bloomed. But within this muck, invisible sources pull words this way and that, like marionette threads controlled by an unnamed puppeteer. The dean of my medical school remarked that medicine is the ultimate of the humanities, and I found myself agreeing. Medicine reveals how the invisible forces all around us shape people's very bodies. You can't be what you can't see, but seeing is insufficient. There are so many forces besides genetics and individual ambition that shape our bodies. They change the expression of our DNA, narrow our arteries, shut the flow of blood, nurse nests of pain deep in our abdomens. Maya Angelou said, someday we'll be able to measure the power of words. I think they are things. I think they get on the walls. They get in your wallpaper, they get in your rugs, in your upholstery and your clothes, and finally into you. 
Think about it like this. The financial system relies on our belief in the value of money. Racism relies on a collective belief of a critical mass of people in white supremacy. The political nation state relies on a collective imagined community. Here I quote Benedict Anderson. Male dominance is possible because of collective investments of patriarchy, etc. These invisible forces are created and shaped by language. Therefore, language is as real a thing as money, race, gender, and nationality. And like those forces, it has measurable power. Stories convey emotional information where numbers and medical language fail us. They offer a, more, a way to more viscerally experience a person's perspective in a power dynamic that is different from that of clinician patient. Instead, the reader becomes the listener, the one who is given an experience, and the narrator retains the power. In this shift, fleeting though it may be, is an opportunity to push healthcare providers outside our comfort zones as knowledge keepers. Instead, stories suggest, there are ways of knowing we could never dream of. It's important, I think, for doctors to feel this on a cellular level every once in a while. As a physician and writer, I'm constantly hovering around these questions. What silences in our collective conversation are manifested in and through our bodies? What are the secrets we refuse to speak that come out anyway in my exam room every day? What happens if I train the microscope of language on myself? Through writing, I've been developing, I've been training my diagnostician's eye on myself instead of only on my patients, and thus have developed a language for things that before I'd felt only as vague tugs at the edge of my consciousness, intuition inherited from unknown places, subliminal bleeps from other dimensions. My poetry, essays, and fiction represent my attempt to create a language for these other kinds of knowledges. I use them to better understand how I came to be and what has shaped this world into the place where we live. Now I'll share a few of my poems with you. The Forest Fire of Family Trees. The problem is we don't know that many ways of doing things. For instance, neither of us can fry an egg without public radio chattering in our ears. And there are worse blueprints for a home, like what my grandfather taught my uncle. We think we know people until we see the way they eat a banana, totally unlike how we peel and devour the fruit. Only instead of eating a banana, it's something way bigger, like loving another person. As the snowflakes get thicker, I hear myself say exactly what my mother would say when faced with this same situation, and I say it in her voice. It's not that I'm ashamed to share my DNA and most of my life with these two people, it's just that I worry. It's not easy to recognize the odor of toxins you release day after day, which when re rearranged spells door. You cross the threshold and think it's just the cologne of the world, not the smoke in your blood, not grass burning from the little fires ignited by your feet. Origin story. After all this, it's the miracle of what took. Blood vessels nodding their fingers into the red room at the center of me, the cure that worked, the vaccine that won. Today, I explained to a mother and her furrowed brow that the glass vial of purified protein is nothing compared to all that tries to burrow into us with each breath, with just a sip of tap water, soup of viral capsids and acid scraps, heavy metals and chemical residues, the whole sticky swirl of waste humans leave in our wake. We ought to be amazed, I tell her, at what the body fights off and what it opens to hold. Like the child who shifts against the curve of my spine, sucks its thumb a little in the fluid dream it's had for months. I could claim to be the dream maker, but the truth is I have no idea how this tiny world came to be in me. Some passing comet or well-positioned thundercloud must have opened this portal, prepared the threshold, loosed the song that started it all. Lullaby. Scrape a baby's white tongue, and if chunks crumble off, it's milk. If the tongue bleeds, it's thrush. Let the baby thrash, looking for food. If I find a wellspring, let me drink. This is called responsive parenting. Don't rush to console me. Let the baby cry. This is sleep training. Let me palm the dark edges of my own vision when the light goes out. Let me taste what grows in my mouth. Follow the little spine to where it ends in a feathered tail, whipping in a bone straw, innervating my wrists. I can tell myself, reach for that or grab that, and it is done. I smell food, I drink, my thrum a tired anthem. 
I cannot tell from here if my tongue is overgrown or simply overfed. The room is full of shuddering. Milk tongue, milk tongue, your song's getting sour. I haven't slept well since I was born. As a bird, thrush doesn't so much sing as insist. Look, blood. The baby assumes that everything in the room has an explanation. Milk here, blood there, and why. If a baby is sick, take blood from the wrist. Ask it why. I'll never be nursed this way again. My mother says when I cried, my father always came running. This explains the color of my feathers. It's hard to tell if the baby's getting bigger or the room is shrinking, but some things arise. Symbiotically, this species trills a warbling ballad. When a thrush lands on the windowsill, tell the baby, even birds drink milk. I can't tell what's inside the room and what's out. I'd give up blood to know. The baby's cried too long again. I'll turn out the light, place her face up, hush the rooting mouth still in training. I won't ask questions of my tongue. Thank you. Thank you, um, Danny and Ben and Iren. You've given us um, such strong and specific examples of your writing and of what it, how it works and, and what it does. Um, and, and you've allowed it to work on us, which is um, powerfully. And um, what we'd like to do now is turn to um, some questions. I think you've, um, you've certainly struck a chord with our audience, um, but they seem a little wordless um, at this point, except for words of praise. So I think what we will do is, um, uh, have, have a conversation around some things, some points that you made and mentioned um, and let the, the words that you've brought to us and the thoughts um, with that uh, combine into, um, into a, a conversation. So um, first of all, um, I'm struck for each one of you, your mastery with words in the forms that you've chosen uh, to write in. And I'd just like to, hear you talk a little bit about what is the significance of wordplay for each of you. Um, start with Danny putting, um, putting him on the spot. Um, you know, you're all acute listeners, but, but you all know, and it seems to sort of seep through the writing that you really enjoy wordplay. But what would you say to that? Um. Well, true enough. I I enjoy puns and um, and wordplay. I think it, in 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 my remarks, I make the point that tragedy can be failed comedy, I, and and it's um, no doubt there's some degree of self defense. I'm trying to um, lighten up a little bit. Um, uh, one of my associates who teaches poetry in prison was told by his students, professor, you need to lighten up. Um, so there, there's that, but also I, you know, diction is one of these um, tools that, you know, if you, you play around with different words at a different point in a, in a line and the right word will um, deepen the meaning and complicate the meaning. I mean, I'm after being as complicated as I can without um, making my readers run out of the room. Um, and, you know, and sort of finding the right word is, uh, it's, it's pleasurable, it's, it's, it's fun to do that. Um, yeah, Ben, thank you. Yeah, echoing everything that that Danny said. Um, I think there's a genuine joy in it. And, um, you know, for me, writing and reading are so closely intertwined. And so when you have that experience of encountering an idea that's been framed in a different way, you ever thought about it before by the language choice, um, there's something inspiring about that too, where you think, well, can I actually change the way I think about the world by simply deciding what words to use. So there's um, there's an excitement there. Um, but yeah, for me, it just comes out of a, a love of language and the joy of discovery. Okay. 
you're in. Well, I think for me, I have the pediatric perspective on this. And I was just thinking about how play is so important developmentally for children. And when we think about how young children learn the world, they learn it through play. It's an essential part of development. And I think it's the same for me. I, I think play with language is a way that I improve and deepen my relationship to language and learn more about language's capacity to express various things. So I think it's it's a natural kind of part of the development of my voice as a writer. And that seems to mirror the, the way that play functions for all of us in, in our development as human beings. Great. So um, we have several questions here that have to do with um, your writing practice. Um, but this, this one starts with um, an interesting question. What is the rhythm of your writing like? When are the sort of overflows where you have to get this out? And when do you take time to craft your words a bit more? And particularly, and this was a question um, that echoes some other questions, where in the world in a busy life of medical practice, where do you find the time? But back to what is, what is the rhythm of your writing like? Anybody who wants to grab at that one? Well, you know, poets start out writing um, in iambic pentameter where there's a, you know, every two beats, there's a stress beat. But I, I think I started out writing and sounding more like Dr. Seuss than, um, than uh, Milton. Um, so I, I, I think poetry is supposed to be musical. And I think the, the prose writers, mostly fiction writers who I admire, um, have very musical language. I mean, you know, if, if, if I think of Faulkner, um, um, the, so the, 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 and, and then you go back to it again and again and again until it sounds right. And um, something we haven't mentioned is, is syntax, just sort of the construction of a sentence, you know, and, and um, a lot of sentences have um, a subject, uh, a verb and an object. And, and, and once you learn how to vary that and to complicate that and sort of bring the sentence all the way down the page, um, it's, it's a way of entrapping the reader so that they, they want to find out, you know, how this almost sort of gravity defying sentence can ever sort of come to an end. Um, so as, as my writing developed, I, I wrote longer and longer poems, you know, and with um, more complicated sentences and it, you know it, it kind of felt like the guy on the unicycle who's juggling lit torches and then somebody tosses him a, a chainsaw that's running and uh, and being able to do that I mean that, that would be my goal as a writer uh, to juggle on be able to ride a unicycle and juggle mm -hmm. so and also what you mentioned Danny was was something that actually enlists uh, the reader almost as a playmate um, as, as you're working with words in the way that, that Iren was, um, was talking about. Yeah. So um, who, who, were your, um, who were your models or your mentors um, as writers? And, and maybe they weren't even writers, but you know, where was your inspiration to um, to, to move into writing and to call yourself a writer? I can jump in on this and, and also to piggyback off the last question, I would say my rhythm is tidal. It sort of comes and goes in waves and depending on what I'm writing, uh, there are different times of day or times in my life where it makes more sense to focus on it. So I tend to write poetry very late at night, which only works if I have a schedule the next day where I can sleep in a little bit. Um, and so for me as an academic physician, one of the nice things is flexibility. And so not every day is the same, which allows me to have later evenings some days and then other days I, I can't do that. So I definitely don't have a daily writing practice. Um, I wrote a novel in residency on a series of night shifts as a third year resident, just because I really didn't like going to sleep at night if I had to sleep during the day. So while the interns were sort of running the floor and I was there supervising them, I was kind of sitting in the background of the workroom working on this novel. So for me, it depends on, on the type of writing. But I guess my, my first model 
was actually my father because he, maybe this comes from having trained under Danny Becker, I don't know, but he always had a very strong interest in the arts and literature. And for a while, when I was a child, I remember him working on a novel late at night, which nothing really came of, of that. But um, I just remember him as this model of a person who could be a physician and be very serious about his medical practice. And then also, and you know, in the hours of the evening, very seriously work on a literary practice. And he was the one who sort of encouraged me to consider both as viable careers. Um, so I guess that he would be my first role model. But going forward, I think more of my role models have been poets who have no connection to medicine, but have been more of my artistic role models in terms of craft. Others of you about your models. Um, I, I, I read Chekhov when I was in high school and, and, and as a writer, you really captured my imagination. You know, I think a lot of people will read Chekhov and then read about Chekhov because his personal life was, was so interesting. And so reading a short story, and I remember this one detail where um, uh, the protagonist is at uh, a dinner party and one of the guests knocks over uh, a cup of gravy with the, his wrist and no one notices except the protagonist and it bothers the protagonist so much. It's almost like a, a Larry David moment of neuroses, but um, then going from that story to learning that Chekhov really valued um, observation in his medical practice and writing very early on, I learned that there's, um, you know, this fusion between the two practices of close observation and again, the, the joyful observation where it's also really funny when someone knocks over a cup of gravy and no one notices. Um, but I think um, Chekhov, you know, continues to loom as a giant in my mind simply because he was so good at writing too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Iren, you mentioned uh, at one point, poetry depends on uncertainty. It strikes me that medicine is rife with uncertainty. Uh, the ways we present its bodies of knowledge, notwithstanding that uncertainty is there every time we meet a patient. Any comments that any of you have about writing and uncertainty for you as a medical practitioner? Yeah, I mean, I would, my, my first small book of poems was called Chance, and my current book is called Second Chance, and I, I think, you know, chances, and I used to teach statistics, um, and I've, I've had memorable failures teaching statistics to medical students who uh, once compared my lectures to listening, watching paint dry, or watching grass grow. And of course, that raised the question for me, well, isn't, aren't those two absolutely different experiences? watching grass grow and paint dry. And I'm, I'm kind of been stuck at that, at that question. Um, but yeah, chance is, uh, it, it, it allows, you know, it, it's, it's triggers imagination and wonder, what if? Mm -hmm. You know, once upon a time is really asking about chance. Anyone else on uncertainty? One of the things that struck me, Ben, in your essay, your wonderful essay, um, were the ways you moved in and out of different kinds of possible certainties when you were exploring the various animal metaphors um, that, that, you know, both what was being done in the novel that you were referring to, but also in your attempts to get a sense of who might Mr. S be. Um, and finally coming to terms that, you know, he was not really capturable in, in a metaphor, animalistic or otherwise. Um, and you had to learn to let him be in all his uncertainty, um, which, was, which was powerful. Thank so you. We have, uh, yeah, oh, the, the okay. one thing I'll just say on that is that yes. a lot of the time in hospital medicine, we talk about inhabiting uncertainty. And so we talk about that from the, the brand new third year medical student all the way up to somebody about to retire is a big part of, of clinical care in the hospital is defined by uncertainty, both clinical uncertainty and more emotional, spiritual uncertainty. And so the process of inhabiting uncertainty can oftentimes be painful and not feel that comfortable. 
Um, and so I think you, you get that both in writing and in clinical practice. Great. Thank you for your nice words. So we have come to the end of our short hour. I want to thank um, Irene Matthew, Ben Martin, and Danny Becker for a wonderful hour and some illuminating looks into your understandings of why you write, why other doctors might write. And we hope this is inspiring for some in our audience um, to try their hands as well. Please join us next week for a program with Louise Aronson from UCSF in San Francisco. She'll be talking about elderhood, redefining aging, transforming medicine, and reimagining life. And we'll also be joined by Justin Mutter, a UVA geriatrician. Thank you all and please join us next week.